Good morning, everyone. Bonjour tout le monde. This morning's town hall on long-term care national standards with Green Party leader Amani Paul and special guests Laura Tamblin Watts, Dr. Tamara Daly, and Dr. Abdou Sharkawi will now begin. L'Assemblée publique sur les soins de longue durée avec la chef du Parti vert Amani Paul et ses invités Laura Tamblin Watts, Dr. Abdou Sharkawi, et Dr. Tamara Daly va maintenant commencer. Thank you very much, Rosie. Uh, good morning, uh, bonjour. Thank you very much for being with us today for this discussion on long-term care and the future of long-term care uh, within the context of the pandemic and outside of it as well. Uh, I'm coming to you from the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee. Uh, bonjour tout le monde, merci d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui pour uh, cette discussion sur uh, l'avenir uh, de uh, notre système uh, de soins de longue durée. Uh, je suis ici sur les territoires uh, des Mississauga, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee et Huron-Wendat. I am so pleased uh, to have with me two, two guests that we have hosted before, uh, Laura Tamblin Watts and Dr. Shakarwi, and also to welcome uh, Professor Daly as well. Uh, it's always such a great opportunity for me to learn more and for me to make sure that uh, what I am communicating is the most up-to-date information about what we can do in long-term care. Uh, we have seen a humanitarian crisis and a national tragedy unfolding in our long-term care throughout this crisis, uh, throughout the pandemic. We know that the second wave of our pandemic was worse than the first in terms of deaths. Uh, and this tells us that many of the lessons that we should have and could have captured uh, between the first uh, wave and the second uh, were not, uh, and they were not put in place. Uh, yet today, uh, again, we have another major um, investigative report uh, that, uh, that quotes uh, Professor Daly extensively, highlighting that the violations continue. And so what we want to talk about today, amongst other things, is what comes next. We know that vaccinations are being, have been ramped up and are, are being uh, distributed throughout our long-term care centers, uh, so that is underway. Um, that has always been one part of the puzzle. And so we want to talk about within the context of the pandemic, are there things that we could and should be doing and what should we be considering uh, for the post-pandemic period? Alors, uh, c'est vraiment plaisir uh, d'accueillir uh, Professor Daly, Laura Tamblin Watts et Dr. Shakarwi pour notre uh, discussion sur uh, l'avenir uh, des centres de soins de longue durée. On sait qu'une une crise humanitaire uh, s'est déroulée uh, dans nos centres de soins de longue durée et que la deuxième vague était encore pire uh, que la première vague, que nous avons des milliers uh, de nos résidents de centres d'hébergement et de soins de longue durée qui sont morts uh, sans cause d'une manière complètement évitable parce que nous n'avons pas réussi à... Um, um, à mettre en place uh, les, les mesures entre la, la, la première vague et la deuxième vague. Alors, uh, aujourd'hui, c'est une opportunité d'entendre directement des experts uh, qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire uh, pour uh, mieux protéger uh, nos résidents des, des CHSDL uh, dans le court terme et aussi dans, dans le long terme aussi. Um, on sait que les, les vaccins se, se déroulent maintenant dans nos centres, mais c'est que une partie de la solution. Alors, um, je, je passe maintenant la parole à, à nos, um, nos panélistes. I'll just introduce them very quickly. Uh, Laura Tamblin Watts is the president and CEO of CanAge, and she has been a has been an, an, a tireless advocate on behalf of the aging. She's also someone who has been particularly vocal and, and, and a strong advocate uh, in the context of the pandemic and its impact on uh, seniors and on long-term care. Uh, Dr. Abdul Shakarwi is an infectious diseases specialist uh, and he's part of the University Health Network. Uh, his specialization um, includes internal medicine and infectious diseases. He is also an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Toronto and is often called on for his expertise uh, with respect to our response to the pandemic. And Dr. Tamara Daly, uh, who is a professor 
and also director of the York University Center for Aging Research and Education, then director of the SSHRC Partnership for Age-Friendly Communi uh, Communities within Communities. And as I mentioned, uh, as recently as today, uh, had been um, discussing some of the some of the situation that we find ourselves in here in Ontario. I'm going to ask uh, Laura if she would uh, if she would speak first. Laura, thank you for being with us. Uh, if you could just share where where you see that we're at now and where we need to be uh, in the future, both in terms of the the urgent needs and and the more medium to long term. Thank you very much. Bonjour tout le monde. I'm coming to you from the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq and the unceded land therein. And I wanted to give respect to their elders past and present. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Certainly, as we're looking at the lessons learned in long-term care over this past nearly year, we see that we have never failed to fail seniors. And we have seen so clearly the tide coming in each wave. And what we have done is very little to both prevent that wave from happening and where it has hit, we have not taken in many cases the critical steps that we need. And so what are some of those critical steps? I'll speak at a high level because of course it does depend where you are across this country, what your experience is and if you're in an urban or rural setting. But in long-term care homes, we have traditionally neglected them and then we have specifically neglected them over the course of this pandemic. We have been very uh, slow to maneuver. We have been very slow to add more staff. We have very slow to get the infection prevention and control requirements, expertise in home. And where we have had some success, rapid response units in New Brunswick, mass hiring in Quebec, you know, early uh, vertical integration of PPE in Alberta, those lessons have not been shared across the country. So we've had unique successes and they have not been learned. You know, on the whole, where has that left us? We're in the conversation about national standards and I think that's the conversation we do need to be in. There's a more existential conversation about for-profits and not-for-profit homes, but right now, what do we need to do to make seniors more safe? As we're looking at a third wave with variants, we know that we need to make sure that we get older adults in long-term care fully vaccinated. That's not happened everywhere across the country. We're, we're getting there. We're almost there. We need to make sure both doses are in the arms of our older adults, plus their essential family caregivers, plus their essential workers who are there. So that's critical. And then testing is going to be a key piece of it as well. So do we need national standards? Yes, we do. This is not the time to get caught up in politics. And we're starting to see some political parties point fingers jurisdictionally. And I think what we need to say overarchingly is if it is not now that we bring standards in place to ensure the rights and well-beings of older Canadians in long-term care, when would it possibly be? So national standards now, greater support for infection prevention and control, and a mix of federal and provincial money needs to be invested quickly. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Dr. Shikari, uh, just, just picking up on some of the things that, uh, that Laura said, just in terms of now, we, we have the vaccinations. Um, is that the end of the story for this particular moment? Are there other things that should be done right now on an, on an urgent basis beyond vaccinations? Um, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, inviting uh, me for this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts on a subject that I think is very near and dear to the hearts of many Canadians. Um, and finally, one that is getting the attention that I think it merits long overdue. Um, you know, I, I would liken the vaccines to, um, you know, stopping a situation of serious hemorrhaging and the national standards uh, being required as trying to ensure that we don't have repeat episodes of serious internal bleeding that are going to compromise the very lifeline of uh, long-term care as an institution. Uh, I think we can all agree, if we're being honest enough with ourselves, that even prior to the pandemic, there were more than enough uh, signs 
that there were serious problems in terms of oversight, in terms of safety standards, of the structure and design that is fundamental to how most long-term care institutions operate in Canada. And unfortunately, it took a perfect storm, if you will, in the form of a pandemic uh, with a highly transmissible virus in a very vulnerable population that was very susceptible by means of poor governance of the way in which they were being protected to shine a light on this in a very devastating way. And my fear is that if this discourse fades once we have completed our vaccinations of all long-term care residents, even of the staff and their essential caregivers, we have done a great disservice to our elders in Canada and we have done a great disservice to the ethical principles that should guide us in terms of how we manage a very important part of our community. We have to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that those systemic issues that we failed to address in the first wave and in the second wave do not get left unaddressed. Understaffing, uh, inadequate infection prevention and control uh, mechanisms in terms of protocols and dedicated teams that are involved. That has to be something that is made a high priority going forward. Um, we can talk about whether or not profit or nonprofit leads to the commodi commodification of care and leads to the incentivizing of maybe cutting corners. That's a debate for another time, but I think it tells us that we have to be extremely vigilant about understanding that if we are going to allow privatization to remain, there has to be standards that are put in place to hold any uh, corporate entities to account for ensuring that they are meeting these standards. My fear is not just a third wave involving our long-term care institutions. My fear is another pandemic, which could very well occur within all of our lifetimes. There's absolutely no reason to suspect that that shouldn't be the case. And if we don't do what we should to ensure that these systemic issues are addressed, then that is a huge blight on us as a nation and as a society uh, if we don't address that and we allow the same thing to occur again in the future. It's simply unacceptable. This dialogue must be left open and we cannot accept anything but a national standard that is applied broadly to allow for consistent principles to be executed across this country and to protect our seniors once and for all. Ms. Paul, we can't hear you, Ms. Paul. Sorry. Yeah, I lost the feed. I, that, no, no, that was me. <laughs> Technology. I apologize, but I was saying thank you very much for 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 that, Dr. Shakari, and and I, I couldn't agree more that really the only fitting tribute for all of the lives that we have lost, um, all of the people that have been lost unnecessarily in long term care, is to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And uh, you know we do know that we will be back here again unless things change. The pandemics are happening more with a greater frequency. Um, exactly because of you know the the decisions that we make as humans and our encroachment on the natural world and so you're absolutely right even after this we have to think of the next one um, just building again on on Dr. Shakari's uh, uh, comments uh, Dr. Um, Professor Daly Dr. Daly Professor Daly uh, I'm wondering if you can can touch upon that theme because it is one that is certainly under consideration, the difference between for-profit and not-for-profit uh, care, and also uh, the, the benefits of, of community care, because that is something that we know Canada dramatically underinvests in as compared to other OECD countries. We invest less than half of the OECD average in that. Um, and perhaps you can uh, touch on uh, those uh, those two those two themes, and of course anything else that you would like to. For for sure, I will touch on those, and I, I want to start by uh, thanking both of the previous speakers as well because I couldn't agree more. 
Um, and, and I feel as though we've come to this place um, in, a, in a very slow moving way where there's been insufficient attention on uh, care for older adults for um, the entire uh, part of my career where I've been studying this. So as a professor of health policy and equity, I've spent the last two decades re uh, researching alongside excellent teams of colleagues who've been studying long-term care and community care. And our research really started out by documenting the worst parts of the long-term care system. So we talked about the understaffing, the poor working conditions and the poor conditions of care. But with a view to really wanting to push for change, we began focusing on the most promising practices about 15 years ago. And we did so by conducting comparative research internationally that demonstrates how policies, practices and programs can be improved. We've really shared this research very widely because uh, we, we've spent thousands of hours across Canada, in Australia, New Zealand, Germany, Norway, the US and the UK. We've observed long term care on the front lines. We've surveyed workers. We've conducted thousands of in-depth interviews with frontline and support staff, with families, residents, volunteers and with managers. We literally speak to everyone and, and interview and try to get all of these perspectives. And our research has documented myriad promising practices and policies that work to bring re uh, dignity and respect to residents, as well as decent work for care practices. Um, and I think that one of the promising policy approaches is to focus on national standards for long term care. And it's by focusing on national standards for long term care where we can address uh, some of the um, some of the biggest problems I feel that have plagued the system, including the understaffing, the poor working conditions, the poor care conditions, but also the excessive profit taking that exists where uh, people are not getting the care that they deserve and residents uh, uh, are not getting the attention that they deserve and workers aren't getting the supports that they deserve in terms of their working conditions. Now, most developed nations have systems for regulating the quality of their aged care services. Each system varies in the extent to which it focuses on principles and values, how it defines and assesses quality, how it approaches inspection, enforcement, compliance, and how it punishes negligence, and the extent to which it's focused on either the system, the provider organizations, or the frontline care. The variety of country approaches um, include uh, those such as Australia, where they're focused on organizational and provider outcomes, or others like in Scotland, where they're written from the perspective of the person receiving care. Um, but what is important to note is that most countries have national standards for long term care and for community care. Canada's does not and this needs to change. I think it's really important for us to consider the ways in which we can best support this sector that we can preserve the dignity and respect that the people that need to uh, receive services uh, can be insured and also those who are providing their care need to um, count on. So that's where I'd like to start. Thank you very, very much for that. And uh, I, I have to say, I say this every time, we've had numerous, numerous um, <clears throat> discussions on long-term care throughout this pandemic. And I am always struck by the level of consensus and unanimity amongst the experts uh, like yourselves about what needs to be done in what order and in terms of pri priority as well. It, it is really striking. And it does seem, um, Professor Daly, that, uh, we have certainly arrived at a point where we know, you know, there is that consensus, we know. And so it's really just a question of action. And, and in terms, of, in, terms of, of, uh, in terms of this particular moment, as we continue to struggle with, uh, with the, the pandemic, uh, are, there, are there other needs of, of seniors? I mean, we were, talk, we, were, we were talking about life and death, people dying of, of infections from outbreaks. But are there other needs that we are seeing uh, that continue to be unmet? Are there other stresses on the system that are putting seniors at risk? Because we know there are those who die from COVID infection, and then there are those who die from neglect and lack of attention and so forth. Um, with respect to that, Dr. Shakawi, uh, any, any observations you'd like to share? Yeah, I mean, I think you took the words right out of my mouth, unfortunately. Yeah, when you talk about neglect being something that is almost systemically uh, witnessed throughout long-term care, and I can attest to that uh, practicing internal medicine as I do with a significant proportion of my patients at any given time during the year, uh, being admitted to hospital because of significant nutritional deficiencies, severe dehydration, 
um, other issues that are, I can't prove, but certainly seem very likely to be at least somewhat attributable to neglect. And you hear uh, after speaking with family uh, members, uh, et cetera, uh, that their loved ones have not been looked after uh, very uh, diligently. And that's not a disparaging uh, reflection on the staff that are available at these long-term care facilities. They're working very hard, but unfortunately they are under-resourced, they're under-supported, and therefore, Sometimes these really terrible outcomes are a reflection of that. It's not a lack of commitment uh, within the work culture of these facilities. It's a lack of commitment and investment in the resources that are put in there in the first place. And so I, I think that is hand in hand what needs to be understood uh, as part of the problem here, whether it's related to uh, an infectious issue or anything else when it comes to the maintenance of care the monitoring um, and, and the supervision uh, that elders require. At this point, it is clear that it is woefully inadequate in many of our institutions. Uh, it's inconsistent, uh, whether you're talking about private or not-for-profit institutions, and again, speaks to the importance of having a standard in place to try and ensure that there is clarity and a consensus understanding regardless of what the ownership structure is, that there should be some set of expectations that need to be met and some consequences that will follow if those are not met. Because right now, the signs of neglect are just too apparent and they've been that way for a very, very long time. It's very hard to see as a physician. I see Laura nodding along. Um, Laura, beyond beyond uh, vaccinations, are our seniors still at risk? Are they still at significant risk? Um, I see. I saw you nodding. So please tell me what you were nodding about. We are we are in the middle of a pandemic that is one drop in a larger ocean of system problems, and Dr. Daly's work really speaks to many of those problems. I wanted to focus and build off of my colleague, Dr. Sharkway, on his comments about neglect. We have seen a rise of elder abuse and neglect reported anecdotally about tenfold in the community on top of what's happening in long-term care. And, and part of that conversation is also how we view older adults. So this is a conversation where we need to talk about ageism and we need to talk about social exclusion. This has been as clear as we can possibly make it during a time where it was seen somehow acceptable to close off older people who were by their nature vulnerable and fragile, that's why they are in long-term care, from any interaction with essential family caregivers or even in some cases a breath outside of their own rooms. And I challenge us to think about what other segment of the population that that would have been considered acceptable. I mean, it's clearly the claims for wrongful detention are going to be considered on a go forward basis. But the idea that we were even okay as a society with decisions that socially excluded people from their most basic relationships, in some cases putting people in isolation, and I mean very specifically in a room in isolation, not even just in a larger facility. We need to then be challenging ourselves about what those walls mean in long-term care. Do they mean that you are separate from society as we have apparently understood it to be? Or are they walls that are supposed to keep people healthy and well and support housing and care in a home emotion focused environment. I'm sad to say it is not the latter and that's where we need to get to. I'm going to use that as a direct jumping off point to come back to Professor Daly with respect to community care. Uh, we, we institutionalize and I think that that's the right uh, word to use given what it looks like in our country um, seniors and people with, uh, with disabilities that require ongoing care, uh, as opposed to having, having them placed within the community, as opposed to having supports uh, so that people can remain at home and age in place, et cetera. Uh, Professor Daly, what is uh, the comparative best practice in terms of 
community-based, agent community-based uh, service? I think the best practice here is one that sees all of these parts of the system uh, linked. So we can't see long-term care as separate from the need for home and community care and other types of assistance and as separate from the hospital. Um, because all of these parts of the system operate in ways that reinforce or make it worse uh, in other parts of the system. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that community care and home care supports and services need to be robust. They need to be able to support people um, so that they can remain living independently as long as they wish to. However, not everybody can remain in their home. And so we need high quality, excellent long-term care because people don't think that they will need long-term care. They don't uh, want to need long-term care, but the, the truth and the reality is that good long-term care is absolutely required and that we as a society shouldn't see long-term care as a second class option because I've, I've seen situations where the needs of, of particular people um, outstrip the capacity of even the most well-resourced of families. And so families need to know that when long-term care is the option, that it's a high quality option that they are um, getting the support and the services that are required. And we as, as a country need to support people who need long-term care. Now in Ontario, we have 39,000 people on a waiting list. So it's not that people are being put into long-term care too soon. In fact, it's probably the case that we are not allowing people the choice that they need to make in order to have access to good quality long-term care when they need it. So our system as a whole needs to take into consideration uh, needs around home care, community support services, the things like Meals on Wheels and friendly visiting and, and those sorts of things, activities, um, support with activities of daily living, and also long-term care services when it's required. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just going to ask you if you, if you all had some concluding remarks. I mean, we could really speak about this for, for such a long time, and we will. You know, we, our approach has been to have discussions often, regularly and often, to make sure that this stays on, on the agenda. Uh, just in terms of this week then, this moment, uh, is, is there anything uh, additional that, uh, that you would like to, to add? It's now- oh, yeah, I was gonna start with you, Laura, and then move it's to you. now the time that the government of Canada is engaging in its budget review. So now is the time where the checkbook is open and we're making strategic decisions about what gets money and what does not get money. One of those strategic decisions will include whether or not federal funding will flow really for the first specific time to long-term care. And if so, how will that money be received or tethered to long-term care standards? In our respectful view, we have seen money sent for other issues like home care go into the general treasuries of provinces. And we believe strongly that the conversations around national long-term care home standards and the budget process will need to be tied together. Now is not the time to play politics. And we're very concerned right now that the Conservative Party is starting to pull back from the idea of national standards. When it's, this is a time where above all, we need to make sure that yes, standards are in place, but that the funding will go to the homes. We have never failed to unfund seniors, and this is a real risk unless we have something that we can directly tie that will go to this sector. Thank you very much, Dr. Shakarwi. I would echo everything that Laura has said right there. I think that there has to be a dedicated investment with a strategy that earmarks uh, funding specifically for long-term care directives. Um, it cannot be left uh, to a discretionary pool. It must be something that has some degree of sustenance to it and grounding uh, that says this is a pledge to make this a priority. I also want to point out that I think a lot of us lose sight of the fact that by taking the shortcuts, by not having the oversight, by not having the investment in long-term care, 
we're doing a disservice on every metric you want to look at, whether you're talking about healthcare resource utilization or losses from a financial standpoint um, outside of those private operators themselves. So it's in our collective interest, actually, to have a better standard in place that's going to make these facilities safer over the long term. I think that will have benefits that uh, echo widely uh, throughout our healthcare system, and that's something we shouldn't lose sight of. So I'm hopeful that the government of Canada does what it can to make sure that this is a priority they're going to need to. Thank you very much. And finally, Professor Daly. Uh, yeah, I'd say that the regulation and inspection systems that we have in place have done little to deter the, the worst actors and that these repeated violations that we're seeing show us that the provincial level systems are not enough. And I'd say that the regulations uh, provide little incentives in my province of Ontario for homes to be better than mediocre and there's really no penalty for being mediocre or worse. Uh, I think that by addressing uh, national standards in long-term care, the federal government can use its spending power um, and can tether it, I like that word, Laura, it can tether it to um, performance on national, um, national standards. And I wanna push the, even the word standard to uh, get us to think about principles. And I'd also like to remind everybody that the Canada Health Act was passed in a minority government situation. And so we are at a point where we're all singing from the same uh, song sheet. People have understood that Canada has performed amongst the worst when it comes to protecting the lives of older people in this country and that we need to do better. Um, we're not going to look away. If we look away, I think that says more about who we are as Canadians than almost anything else that we do in the in the coming years. And so my suggestion is to push, to push hard, and that it's possible even in a minority government situation. Thank you very much. And, and thank you so much to all of you for once again, educating and offering your expertise and, and insights. Uh, there is no question, Professor Daly, just to echo what you have said and what we've heard today, that uh, this is something we cannot look away from. And I, I believe that regardless of what we do uh, from this point forward, we will be grappling with, uh, with the legacy of what we did not do during this pandemic and the lives that were lost unnecessarily because of it. Uh, in my case, and this is why I believe you need many different kinds of people in politics, I come at this with the understanding of someone who lost um, uh, a, a parent uh, during long-term care, uh, sorry, in long-term care during this pandemic, uh, from the perspective of someone who had her, her grandmother and a number of her, uh, her female relatives working those low-paying, hard, uh, personal support worker jobs in long-term care, trying to provide enough uh, attention to the people that they were caring for under incredibly difficult circumstances. And then also as, as a policy analyst who understands, as, as you said, Professor Daly, and as you, Laura, and Dr. Sharkawi said, that this is, on all the metrics, this is something that, that makes sense. Uh, and you're, you're all absolutely correct uh, when you say that uh, this is something that should not be viewed through a partisan lens. It's something that if ever we could come together across party lines to work on, this is it. Um, there is that consensus amongst the experts. And so the job really is then to just get it over the finish line. And I hope that we will see that action in, in the context of this session of parliament and not delayed to the, the next session of parliament. So we will be certain to invite you all back uh, again. Uh, certainly, uh, this is something that we will be persistent about until we see the action that you have all proposed. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for giving your time today. If you just uh, hang tight while we say goodbye to those who are following us on, on Facebook. Merci à tout le monde d'être ici avec nous aujourd'hui uh, pour cette discussion. Nous allons avoir des autres dans les deux langues officielles et je vous invite uh, de nous joindre. Uh, merci beaucoup à nos uh, trois participants uh, et nous allons dire uh, merci au revoir sur Facebook maintenant. Thank you. And we will now go to the questions. One question, one follow up. On va commencer avec des questions, une question, un suivi. Please use the raised hand feature if you wish to ask a question. Veuillez utiliser la fonction de lever la main si vous voulez demander 
quelque chose, poser une question. On va commencer avec David Thurston de CBC. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I, you know, I haven't really heard it described to, to me in any way about how we overcome the political realities that we have a system where healthcare is a provincial territorial jurisdiction. So uh, I don't know if maybe Professor Daly uh, or Madam Paul that maybe you've had some thoughts about this, about how you get this through when, you know, constitutionally, this is just a provincial jurisdic jurisdiction. I'll just say something quickly and then pass it over to Professor Daly. Uh, first, I, I, I think the most important point to make before getting into the, the, the details of that question is to say that our federation was designed to facilitate the protection of people in Canada. It was designed to facilitate cooperation on behalf of people in Canada, not to be a barrier to it. And I think that the greatest threat that we could pose to the, continue, the continued confidence in our federation is when people begin to see um, jurisdiction as something that, uh, that harms them more than it helps them. Uh, in the case of healthcare, uh, we have the Canada Health Act. Despite the, the jurisdiction being given to the pro uh, provinces, uh, there was a moment in time, as Professor Daly said, where we came together and, and created a Canada Health Act exactly because we knew that both levels of government needed to be involved and that it was going to protect people in Canada. And this is, this is a, an act uh, that I would mention that was first initiated, or let's say developed under a liberal government. And then it was a conservative government that brought it uh, to parliament uh, for a vote. And it was a unanimous uh, vote across party lines that brought in our Canada Health Act. And so I don't believe that those, uh, those, those moments are behind us. I believe that when we see that we are failing our most vulnerable citizens, uh, when we have had decades to get this right and we have not been able to under our current system, and when the experts are speaking with such unanimity about what needs to be done in order to address the, the fatal, the fundamental flaws in the structure of long-term care in this country, that this is exactly the moment uh, where our provinces and our federal government can certainly come together, agree on national standards, agree on whether it's folding it into the Canada Health Act or modeling our system, a system after the, the Canada Health Act. Uh, we, we, need, uh, we need to do that. And certainly I don't think that jurisdiction uh, should impede that. I will point out also that the government is, is in the course, is in, in the course of introducing new um, universal programs. There's a plan to introduce universal childcare, which we support. Childcare and education is also a provincial, um, a provincial jurisdictional um, um, uh, domain. And so, you know, we can't, we can't decide we're going to do the very best we can for our youngest, uh, our youngest uh, citizens and, and neglect, continue to neglect our oldest. Uh, Professor Daly. Yeah, well, the Canada Health Act is certainly one of the, um, the most important parts, I think, of our federal legislation where the federal government gets to use its uh, spending power and the provinces, in order to have access to that funding, um, have to meet national standards. The Canada Health Act had a fatal flaw. And the fatal flaw was that long-term care was considered not an insured service, but an extended service. And that in some ways has put us where we are today with long-term care uh, outside of the system in some respects and not funded or thought of in the same ways as hospital and physician care. Um, having said that, I think that we are at a really important point where we better understand the way that hospitals, uh, what it is hospitals can do and can't do and the way in which people need to receive care in the community because technology has advanced. Uh, things have changed. People are living longer um, and uh, they are healthier longer as well. Having said that, I think that we just need strong parallel standards and legislation that enables the federal government to use the incentive of the, the money um, in order to ensure that provinces can step up and do the right thing. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Shakari has to, to step off. I just wanted to check and see if there might be any questions for him before he has to go. He's wearing scrubs, so I think he definitely has to go. Uh, Rosie, did you want to just check and see if there were yeah. any, any questions for Dr. Shakari before he has to step off? 
Yes, does anybody have questions for Dr. Shekawi, please? Uh, uh, okay, Neil Rabson's gonna ask a question in a minute. It's not for Dr. Shekawi, so okay. I think that's fine. Uh, but Ms. Tamlin Watts had something to say, so perhaps, thank you, Dr. Shekawi. Okay, perhaps before Dr. Shekawi, before you go then, is there any comment you wanted to make on, uh, on that uh, before you step off? No, I think, uh, as you mentioned, I think there's unanimity and conviction uh, between all of us in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, I think what we need to do now is shift our thinking and get back to that paradigm of partnership um, that does not go along partisan lines. And remember, this is, this is a principle that binds us all as Canadians, one that we should be proud of, but one that we can't be smug and complacent about either. We need to make sure that we hold our healthcare system to the highest standards imaginable, regardless of which Canadians we are talking about. And this is our opportunity to do it. I hope that if nothing else, this pandemic serves as a watershed moment for us to remember where we've erred and to do better in the future. And I think we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Shakawi. We're looking forward to, to having you with us again. I, I, again, appreciate so much your time during a very busy day. Thanks so much. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. Rosie, are there any other questions for us? Uh, yes, I just wanted to go back to Ms. Tamblyn Watts. I believe she had something to say to David's question. Uh, your my, thank you. I'll put my lawyer hat on here. And division of powers exists to facilitate a government. It does not mean that we don't have both types of engagement around health. So public health is clearly within the federal realm as well as it is clearly within the provincial realm. Health provision of services also has a, a fairly robust history of dedicated prioritized money. We can certainly see that when it came to things like hip replacements, knee replacements, eye surgery, HPV vaccines, et cetera. So this is nothing new with the idea of focusing in on a key and critical health issue and tethering funds. Thank you. Thank you. Does uh, David, do you have a follow up question, please? I'll just make it really quick. Um, Madam Paul, what do you think of the advice that we're getting about AstraZeneca uh, from the regulator and the advice that we're getting from uh, NASI, the National Advisory uh, Immunized National? <laughs> Nasty. I'll just say that. You know what I'm talking about, <laughs> rather than spending, spelling up it. What do you think about the advice that we're getting from them on this, on, on AstraZeneca? On what is the, what is the, is there something new from today? Because no, 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 no. The, the advice, Health Canada is saying that this, uh, they're approving the vaccine for use of, of, of all Canadians. And NASI is recommending that this be used for people under the age of, of, of 65. 65. Right. So, you know, I'm just wondering what you think about that. Well, I, you, you can see from the panel that we have, we have collected today that I think very highly of the experts and uh, on uh, deferring to those who have done their homework, who have done the research throughout this pandemic, I have said that, and I have said in our party has said that uh, we need to take politics out of the decisions about, of course, which vaccines to approve, how uh, they will be distributed, who will be prioritized. Uh, we actually, in the case of long-term care, would have made uh, far fewer mistakes at uh, the beginning of our vaccine, um, uh, the, the vaccination, uh, if we had, if we had uh, followed that advice because long-term care uh, residents, in the case of Ontario, for instance, were not prioritized at the beginning of our vaccination. So uh, I very much uh, follow the counsel and advice of NACI and of our uh, other health authorities. I know that they're moving, they're working in a very fluid situation and that their advice can change. But for us to have confidence in our vaccination system and in the vaccines themselves, uh, we have to make sure that it is very clear all through that um, our decisions are being uh, absolutely guided uh, by NACI. And I would say also, David, that that applies to uh, very importantly to who is prioritized. Uh, we have groups that have been recommended to be prioritized in the second stage of vaccination. Uh, amongst them, uh, racialized and mar marginalized people living in highly affected communities. And we have yet to hear from many of the provinces that they in fact intend to do that. 
And so we're looking forward to uh, seeing that they do follow that NACI guideline amongst others. Thank you. Mia Rabson from the Canadian Press would like to ask a couple of questions. Go ahead, Mia. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my first question is, there was a story earlier this week that only about half of the long-term care workers in Ontario had opted to get the vaccine. I haven't really seen a lot of data from other provinces, but I'm just wondering um, how much of a concern it is um, that uh, there doesn't seem to be a big uptake among the workers. It seems that the residents um, have been uh, are, have had good uptake, but what impact could it have on that and what needs to happen in order to maybe increase that, that uptake? Uh, I don't know if either of our panelists want to answer that one. Yep, Laura. Thank you for the question. I think there's two pieces that we need to pull apart here. First is the question of vaccine hesitancy. And the second is the question of vaccine availability. We have uh, on the second part first, not made it entirely available to long-term care home workers on as much a priority basis as we have for long-term care residents. So it depends where you are in the country and where the decisions about vaccine supply have been. So if we take that apart and look at the other question around vaccine hesitancy, it is a significant worry. We are hearing anecdotal evidence across this country of hesitancy between 20 and 50%, depending on the individual long-term care home. And we need to understand more why people are hesitant. There has been poor information and poor uh, assurances in some cases in appropriately cultural languages, particularly to the many diverse women who are working often low income jobs and are still perhaps in a period of trying to understand what the vaccine would mean for them. So just because they may be health workers doesn't mean that they are also not needing adequate information which may be culturally appropriate to them. On the whole, should we make sure that people are vaccinated who are providing frontline care? Yes, but this is not entirely new. We have some of these same problems every single year when it comes to influenza vaccine. So the question about vaccine availability is one part of it. The question about vaccine hesitancy is the other. Thank you very much, Professor Daly. Well, as we know that staff of long term care have actually been on the front lines of getting COVID as well. So there are, I, I think we don't simply understand the number of people who may in fact have been exposed or have been are recovering. So the numbers I think need to be tempered and understood in terms of people who are choosing not to get vaccinated because they've already had COVID. I just I don't think we understand enough the, the reasons for that. But I would also just say that it's really, really important that we think about the ways to communicate what it is this vaccine does. Um, what it, it supports, who it protects, why and under what conditions. And we also think about some um, considerations around paid sick leave. Um, and I think that that's one of the key issues that uh, some people have also been speaking about. Um, not having access to paid sick leave, I think is also just another barrier for people who are working in long-term care. And, and just maybe to, to wrap up your question, Mia, it is, uh, we, we know that uh, certain communities uh, are more vaccine hesitant than others. I am part of one of those communities. And it's exactly because uh, these communities have had, in general, quite negative um, interactions with the healthcare system. And there are historical, there are, actually, there are um, up to date reasons for that, and also historical reasons for that. Uh, we have known for some time that we needed to do the work to make sure that uh, we are reaching out to communities, uh, to community leaders, uh, to do that communication that Laura and Professor Daly have mentioned, and uh, some of that work remains undone. And I think all of this again serves to underline how connected these things are, and, and these things have a knock-on effect when you don't provide adequate health care or culturally sensitive uh, health care to communities. Uh, over the long term than when their uh, involvement is needed in order to protect the larger community as it is now, uh, you don't necessarily get that. It doesn't just magically uh, materialize. Thank you. Mia, you had a follow-up? 
Yeah, um, so this question is more is about long term care, but also about seniors uh, in the community. I'm just wondering what knowledge we have, what research we've done on the impact, particularly on mental health of the isolation that's happened to seniors since the beginning of this pandemic. I've heard a number of people say that they feel like their parent or their grandparent declined um, because of that isolation and what impact we think that's had and what we can do to try and, and help overcome that, especially going forward. I'm going to pass that back to uh, the, the two of you. Uh, Professor Daly? Um, I, I think one of the important things to understand about social isolation is that this was a problem pre-pandemic. So again, the pandemic is revealing some of the existing fault lines in our system. And um, uh, in, um, in places like the United Kingdom, they, I think, were faster to acknowledge that social isolation was a real problem for older adults than we have been in Canada. Now, having said that, I think that the attention now is really being paid to some of the, um, the impact of social isolation. And I do see some tremendous work happening um, on the part of community support organizations reaching out to seniors um, in ways that are unprecedented. And this crosses cultural communities, I would also say, because like when I think about the city of Toronto, where I live, there are so many excellent programs, services, and community organizations that are really in touch with their local populations. So they're doing things um, uh, enabled by technology and they're relying on old school technology like telephones to just make sure that they're connecting in with people. Having said that, it's simply not enough. We know that. So uh, once we get out of the worst stages of lockdown, I think that there are going to be really important programs and services that need to be um, uh, supported in order to make sure that we bring people back together in ways that are safe. They're starting to do this in long term care facilities I see in the United States where they they have already uh, had facilities um, that have been inoculated for quite a bit of time. I've seen also some excellent examples of socially distant activities that are really, really engaging. So those promising practices exist. We need to think about ways in, at municipal governments, at provincial governments, and at federal governments for how we can um, quickly support community support organizations in realizing um, uh, and, and, and helping with socialization, so, social isolation. Thank there you is a much. recent study out of McMaster University by Victor Cooperman, which started measuring when social isolation really hit for community dwelling seniors. And his research indicates we did okay for about the first five months, but then after for uh, more well, so less frail, more well community dwelling seniors really started having that impact at about the five month mark. We have started to see studies which are indicating both mental health decline as well as associated physical health decline as a result of it. Um, I just wanted to support the comments by Dr. Daly. Social isolation has been endemic in Canada and many older adults were very subject to social isolation, exclusion and loneliness. We have a minister for loneliness in the UK and we saw that responses out of that ministry during COVID-19 were quite nimble. We did a good job with organizations like the United Way supported by funding from the federal government. And we saw faith communities and community-based organizations looking out for neighbors. Those are just small steps. Is the answer, are there measurable outcomes that are negative? Absolutely, the answer is yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions, please? Est-ce qu'il y a d'autres questions, s'il vous plaît? No further questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. This will conclude today's roundtable. Thank you so much for joining us. Ceci conclut la table ronde d'aujourd'hui. Merci beaucoup pour venir. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Thank you. Merci tout le monde.